Welcome to Roots of Faith Ancestry. I'm Renee Richard, and I have with me Judy Riffle and Leonard Smith III, and today's show will be on church vital records. Last week, we talked about the civil vital records. Again, vital records being those records that were generated to document important events in a person's life, and they're so important to genealogists. And here in Louisiana, we're predominantly Catholic. Uh, the, we have several dioceses that have been producing their own records. We have church records, and it's mandated by Rome that these records be kept that document sacraments in a person's life, baptisms, marriages, confirmations, first communions, um, and we do have funeral books. So what we do is, again, they weren't created for genealogists, but genealogists love them. And because the church has kept these and maintained these over time, they're a wealth of information for the genealogists. Here in Louisiana, if your roots are here, if your family's been here for 200 years, if you are not Catholic, you probably may have gone back to Catholic, you know, back then. So what we're going to look at today is how to use these records, these church records, to document your family history. The Diocese of Baton Rouge here has been producing their records or um, putting them in book form and selling them. They're in repositories all over the world, um, all over Baton Rouge, the state archives, libraries throughout the state. But we've compiled the births, marriages, or baptisms, marriages, and burial records into a series of books. Our latest book is actually a different format because we started in 1900. We had too many records to put in one book, so this one is just births or just baptisms, which records the birth. I'm still on that civil. I'm still <laughs> on that civil. Um, and then from there, we have a series that composes 22 volumes, and they end with 1900, and we we'll, may show a case a little bit later. Um, we've been publishing these. They're done primarily by volunteers, and I can't stress it enough, and that's with all the dioceses, and we're going to run through them. The Baton Rouge ones have been being produced since the 1970s, and the way it all started, even in New Orleans, um, in Archdiocese of New Orleans in Baton Rouge is that we would sell the books and the money that we made from the production, from the sale of the books, went to um, fix our books and preserve our books and make them so that they will last forever, hopefully, um, and kept in um, a climate controlled environment. So we use them for preservation, the, the proceeds. Uh, the New Orleans Archdiocese were, were produ have been producing their books for almost as long as ours. As we said, we're up to 1905 just with baptisms, all the other three sacraments to 1900 in Baton Rouge. New Orleans goes to 1831, um, and they are, I believe, a 12, 14, 12, 19. 19 volume series. Again, um, it's very important also, the other two dioceses, to note that the Lafayette Diocese in South Louisiana and the Homa Thibodeau Diocese look a little bit different. They have a different cover to them, and we'll showcase these. Um, and that they are the same thing, but all of these were done by different people. The diocese, Archdiocese Baton Rouge produced their own. Father Donald Hebert produced the ones in the Lafayette and in the Homa Thibodeau area. So we have these sets that encompass most of South Louisiana, um, the, or the diocese of, this, of South Louisiana. And... Um, I think, Judy, you're going to talk a little bit about what we have the rest of the state because yeah, the outside, Catholics are Yeah, outside here. the diocese you talked about, there are several publications of St. Paul, the Apostle Catholic Church in Avoyles Parish. They've published um, baptism, marriage, and funeral records. Also, there are five volumes of books of the Natchitoches baptisms. Natchitoches is quite old. It goes back to the early 1700s. I have two uh, books here from the 1800s of their baptismal records. Uh, and there's three other earlier books on the Natchitoches records. Okay, um, just to show you how they work and what you need to know about these books, please, plenty of people are familiar with them and um, they come in here and all they wanna do is get their, glean their information out of them. But in the beginning of, of these books, in, it doesn't matter which series, there's a wealth of information and there are instructions on how to use them as well. The other thing it gives is it does give um, whether or not what church's records are in each book. In the case of Baton Rouge, every time a church came into existence, um, they published the records for that book. So by the time we get to volume 22, there are two pages worth of all the different churches and the codes. People will ask, what does this, you know, ASC stand for? If you look in the front of the book, it'll tell you that that's Ascension Catholic Church in Donisonville. 
So it's very important when you begin to learn to use these books that you do um, read it because these are abstracts. The word born is not seen. The word baptized is not seen. There's abbreviations for everything. All of the books and all of the formats, including um, the ones done by Father Hebert, New Orleans, or Baton Rouge, are all follow a standard um, code. You might say it is in the front of the later books. It's not in the front of the earlier volumes. And basically, it will give you the name of the person that is having the sacrament done. It will give in parentheses, hopefully, anything in parentheses that you find in any of these books are parents, a parent. Um, and it may say omitted, but if it's in parentheses, it means the parents are omitted. Um, and then it will give whatever the sacrament is, whether it's um, a code like an M um, or a BT or a BP. It varies depending on who's producing it. So it's very important that you know that. It will give the sacrament, followed by either sponsor, SPO, or witness, um, which are the godparents, and other codes such as MN in our diocese, which means marriage notation. And that's very important because what that may indicate is that there are additional records in our archives that you may want to contact us about. It shows that a marriage notation means that on that document it says where and when they married. It doesn't have to be in our diocese. It just means that it was sent to us. They might have married in Oklahoma and you may need to know that. But it's on that record as MN. So there's a lot of information in that. Then the second set of parentheses is not parents. It is the code for the church book that it comes from. So if you see SJBR, St. Joseph Baton Rouge, usually it's names in the town, and then it's followed by two numbers. First number is the book where it's located. The second number is the page number or the entry number. Please record that. that this is two things. Your source would be the book, the volume, who published it, the page number for your ancestor. To further that, that is where you're getting this information. If we misspell something in that, if it's not exactly the correct record, and, and you want that SJBR 22, whatever it is, in that record, you will have the exact spelling, and then you source it for that record. So it, you're, you're, the way you document varies a little bit. Very important, though, and that, that last number helps us locate the book. And they all work the same way, depending on where they come from. In the case of New Orleans, it's very important to read the beginning of the books because it tells you where the fires occurred that destroyed records. And so in the early 1700s, there are many missing records, both from St. Louis Cathedral, St. John, St. Charles, due to fires that took place that destroyed church records. Those documents are gone, and there's nothing we can do. But to know that, you know then you have to look elsewhere. You're, you may not find a baptism record for, for your ancestor. To give you some idea in, in our church records, and it's probably pretty close around the state, baptisms historically are about 75, 80% complete. Marriages run 60 to 70% complete. Burial records are more incomplete, 40, 50%. In, in the old days, if the priest wasn't available, they would just bury them. Oftentimes it didn't get noted in, in the register books. In Father Hebert's series, the Blue Books of the Lafayette area, it's very important to note in, in them that he has articles in the middle that may not even be church records. And also that in his books, he does have courthouse civil records that we talked about last week. So you might find a civil marriage. You may find a secession of probate, which we'll talk about in a subsequent show. Uh, but he also has articles on for um, cattle brands that existed in St. Martin Parish. Or he has articles on how, they, how, how people name their slaves. There's a wealth of information, history lessons, in some of Father Hebert's books. Um, and he did publish the, um, the Lafouche Terrebonne series as well. So that just is a little quick lesson on how to use these and where to find these. And Leonard, you discovered these late, I believe, did you not? I did, actually in 2009 uh, at one of the, uh, I guess, book festivals that the, uh, the diocese actually had your books on display. And I had actually looked into one of my family um, didn't know, did, actually didn't know this side of the family was Catholic. I uh, always thought this was a Baptist side and actually picked up a book, a random book, and believe it or not, actually found my third great grandfather with his burial information and he was only 37 years old. But from that document, uh, that after retrieving the document, I was able to pull probably another 50 or 60 people in my tree. So these are very valuable records to me and I look forward to using them all the time, which I have. 
And that's one of the things that goes to show because we're all experienced genealogists and family historians. Mm -hmm. You never know when you're going to find the record. Mm -hmm. And I don't care how experienced you are out there. This show is something new to offer. Leonard had no idea his records were in our Catholic books. That's right. Yet. After many, many years, it opened up a whole new branch for you. That's right. So we're going to take a little break, and we'll be back after the break to discuss more. Everyone, I'm Shannon Acord and this is Colette Keith and we're talking about Veritas Vitae, a brand new show that's going to talk about the sacredness of God's gift of life from conception to natural death and every stage in between. We'll be discussing human trafficking to abortion to hunger. So tune in every week to see these episodes and learn how we're all connected by these issues and learn about the power of God's truth. Watch our programming on demand anytime at catholiclifetv.org. Welcome to St. James, one of the oldest parishes in our diocese. One of the most striking features when you walk into our church, of course, is the high altar. And it is a beautiful structure to say the least, but it also serves a function. Whenever we go to Mass, we're mindful that our worship is lifted upwards towards the Lord. And so the height of the high altar is to remind us of the heights of heaven. And the angels that are located on the pinnacles of the high altar are pretty, to say the least, but they also serve a function of reminder as well. Whenever we go to Mass, countless saints and angels are present at the celebration of the liturgy. We have images of the angels here kneeling in adoration over the tabernacle where the Mass is confected and where our blessed Lord resides. The angels are in adoration every time we go to Mass. We have a statue of them. But it's also to remind us that when we come to Mass, we should be in adoration of our Lord as well. We're talking about church records, and I'm Renee Richard, and we're going to go through, and what I'm going to do is talk about my grandfather, and we're going to actually show you, based on some other episodes, how to work backwards and fill out your family group sheet or add to your tree using the Catholic records. So my grandfather, I knew personally, he didn't die until he was in the 80s, till I was buried, uh, but this was a man that would not tell me about his family. He believed that if you dug in the past, you'd find pirates and reprobates. So in my case, interviewing him was not an option. He wasn't going to tell me. So I could get to his little sister, my great aunt, and, um, and then his wife, of course. But I did find out about when he was born. So I, I knew how old he was, but, and I knew his parents' name, but I didn't know a whole lot about him. So based on that, my grandfather was born in 1902. So I would start with the latest production. Luckily, they're out. And I would look it up. They're listed alphabetically. His last name was Bajeron. So I can go to the Bajeron page, and his name was Sam William. And what I would recommend doing when you're researching these, which is why I wanted to do a case study, is when you get to the Bajerons, it's best um, to look for the name spelled many different ways. So it could be William Samuel, or it could be Samuel William. In this case, and the priest oftentimes we know that, because if, if the name was not a holy enough name, we think, then they would add Mary or Joseph or, or a saint name. They would flip the names. So in this case, it's true. He comes up as William Samuel Bajeron, but his birth date matches, so I know it's him. Born on the 29th of December, 1902. It does give who his godparents are, which is important, and it gives his parents as Willie Bajeron and Corrine Boudreau. So I knew of Grandpa Willie. But that was it. I really did. And I knew Corrine, but I didn't know her last name. So at that point, so she was Corrine Boudreaux. 
So what I want to do now that I know who they are, I will work through all the Bajorans during these five years, and, but I'm looking for Willie and Corrine. This is how we do it. Because that way I don't have to worry about the name spelling or how the other siblings' names were spelled. So being he's in the W's now, I'm just going to work backwards, actually. And what I do find is that on, there's none on the page before that, but going one more, I find his brother, Dave Jean-Baptiste Bajeron, born in 1901. So I can add him to my list on my family group sheet. I can continue to look on here, and I'm going to find one more page during those five years. Looking for Willie and Corrine, I find Charles Joseph Henry Bajeron, born in 1905. Now we talked about sources. They all come from this book, first and foremost, but then I did, I went and got my grandfather's baptism record. So it showed that he was born separate from his siblings. He was baptized and well, he was born in Napoleonville, but baptized at St. Anne's in Napoleonville, book two, page 68. I do have the original to look at his name. And so I will also cite that original record. For his brothers, it gives me a piece of genealogy information in that they are not baptized at the same church. The brothers are at St. Philomena. So now I have a question of did they move around? I'm a land experts person and I know they did not move. He was the overseer on Little Texas Plantation. But it tells me they're going in both directions because where that plantation is located, those two churches, one is north, one is south. So they were going in both directions to baptize their children. These are all of the records that I can glean now from 22. Is that correct or did I find another? So I will go to by, or actually from this one doesn't have a volume number. So I move to the next volume. You always work backwards. In this volume, it's volume 22, 1899 to 1900. And in this book on page 64, I find Willie and Corrine. I know their names now and I'm going to work it the same way. I'm going to look for the parentheses of the parents. I'm working through the Bajorans. And what I find is a sister being born in 1899. Her name is Francois. Vivian and my dad says oh I had an Aunt V so now I know that this is correct and that's Aunt Vivian so I don't find any others in volume 22 so I move on to volume 21 continue to work backwards and in volume 21 page 63 I'm going to find another child this is the oldest I find Mabel um, born in 97. This book spans 97 to 98. She's baptized at St. Anne's. So again, we're seeing they're going back and forth between these two churches. That's telling me something about their mobility. From here, let's see, bear with me here. 22, 92, 97. I go back and you're going to find, I actually go back to volume 19 here under Bajorans and you're looking back and they're still having kids but each time I move to a new book I need to also look for Willie's name to see at what point does he marry and it's going to be his parents in those parentheses. So as I go back now I'm back to volume 19 and I find the Bajorans and I'm going to find their marriage. When I find the marriage we haven't talked about a marriage yet but when I do find it it's going to give me his parents. This record actually gives me a lot more information. It says Willie Bajeron and he's age 22. Bingo, I know where to go in the next book working backwards. He's the son of Dubergere Bajeron and Zulme Gilbert. And he marries on the 8th of June, 1892, Corrine Boudre. They give her age, she's 21. And they say she's born at Canal. That's another church. That tells me what church she was probably baptized at and what age, what book to go to. She is the daughter of Emile Boudreau and Leah Gautreau. So I'm going to put those names, I'm going to add those names to my family group sheet where they belong. I will also start a new family group sheet for that couple and I will be able to look up all their children in the same manner that I looked up this family. Besides that information here with, with those um, ages given to me now, I can fill in more information at the very top of my family group sheet on their vital records being their baptism records. Knowing the ages then, I'm going to backtrack to 
um, I can go back to, and I don't, I don't think I brought that book, volume 11, so it still gives us a pretty good idea um, for this case study of where I'm going in terms of documenting them and adding them to my sheet here. Now, one thing I do want to talk about now that we've gotten here are those godparents that we saw in that record. That is very important information. In the case of this one, on two of the children, and that would have been on Dave, on Dave and on Charles, the godfather is the same person. He shows up repeatedly in the, in the entries. He's not a family member that I know of. He's not a family member at all because this is one of the last ones I did. So who is he? In later records, in land records, which we haven't gotten to yet, but also in other church records, I do know that he's living in the same area where they're living. And in one record I found where my great-grandfather Willie actually bought the plantation store from him. And then as I researched in other areas, I, come, I find out that he takes a job elsewhere and moves on, but is constantly coming to visit the family. So they're either best friend or a connection that of yet I have not made. Um, some of the other information that was gleaned on here when I was looking for William is that he died in 1956, and I don't have those vital records yet. And I didn't have church records at that point. When I started this, I got his death information, the actual date, from a prayer card that my grandmother had in a prayer book. So you can't ever discount where you're going to find you know, the records that you find. But this gives an example, and then I do have it typed through my program. We talked about different programs. With Family Tree Maker, I worked off of my good old working hand copy <laughs> because I, it, for me it's faster to do it that way. I can make changes and I keep them. And then what I do is once I enter it into the computer, you will see a printed image and it shows you the family group sheet um, of how it looks then. So that gives you some idea of a case study. Um, Talk about some um, things we see in some of the records, particularly concerning um, the marriage records, because we didn't get to that with the civil ones. Um, with the marriage records, they will always, in a Catholic record, give you the mother's maiden name. So it's a little bit different from civil records, courthouse records, where they have, or either for that matter, out-of-state records or public records. They oftentimes group them under the husband's surname. So in the case of the Catholic records, when you have that parentheses, you have her maiden name. If she was married before, it's not going to be her first husband's name. It will always be her maiden name. So that is a clue for you to look for her birth. In this case, Corrine's we found also in the same book with Willie's because they were one year's difference in age, and I just happened to look out in that information. Other information that can be given is residence. We saw that with Corrine being at mm -hmm. Canal. Um, and sometimes they will give the plantation, Little Texas. When I came down to look for my grandfather's, his, in, in our books when he was published, his siblings, some of them did say that. So that just gives you an idea of how to work backwards. You continue on until you reach the brick wall where they had a civil marriage and you don't have a marriage to look at, um, or whatever case might be, all the way back to the 1700s or where, whenever they came to this state. So that, that's how you work the records. And Judy will tell us a little bit more. Well, we're lucky in Louisiana to have these Catholic records, uh, and, but not everyone was Catholic. And <laughs> so we, the uh, Protestants often wish we had the versions of Father Hebert for the Protestants. But uh, unfortunately, uh, those records are not as voluminous as, um, as the Catholic records. But Father Hebert did uh, publish a, a very useful guide. Uh, he published so many useful books. I know those were some of the first books that I used when I was doing genealogy. But this is a, a guide to church records in Louisiana from 1720 to 1975. And uh, it's in two parts. The first part has um, the list of the Catholic churches and when they were established and where they're located. And the second half is uh, the Protestant and Jewish churches and he's listed those by parish. And you'll get some good information about what churches existed at that time, uh, where, uh, when they were established, uh, where the, how far back their records go, where the records were located at the time that this was compiled. Uh, as for the records themselves, most of the Protestant and Jewish churches kept, keep their records in their church. Uh, some may have been placed in an archive, 
Um, for instance, the Episcopal Diocese of Louisiana and New Orleans holds records of defunct Episcopal churches. Uh, Centenary College in Shreveport holds some records for some Methodist churches in Louisiana. Uh, Tulane Archives has some New Orleans church records. Uh, some of those um, church archives may even be out of state, like the Southern Baptist Historical Library and Archives is located in Nashville, Tennessee. And they've microfilmed uh, some of their records, and the Louisiana records are available on microfilm in the state archives and, and a few other places. Um, you might also find microfilm copies of some church records in libraries and archives. Uh, the Family History Library in Salt Lake City has microfilm copies of, of a number of church records, and these you can rent the copies through your local Family History Center. Indexes to some of the church records have been published in genealogical journals like the New Orleans Genesis and La Raconteur. Also, this little publication has, was done by the Christ Episcopal Cathedral in New Orleans. It's a transcription of ba uh, baptismal marriage and death records from 1849 to 1900. So there's a, a lot of places you can go to get some Protestant records. It's not quite as, as uh, convenient as the, the Catholic Church records, but they are out there. One thing to mention also is that if your family originated in, um, in Chicago, in, in some of these other older settled areas, there or through the, the Mormon church that you were talking about, the family centers, some of the dioceses outside of Louisiana have put their records on microfilm through them, and you can actually get them and get other Catholic records there. Another area, real quickly, because we're running out of time and there's so much to talk about, um, one of the other areas that you can look is these different, you mentioned La Raconteur, which is a local um, genealogy association. Various genealogy associations in various areas will oftentimes produce the church records for their, their area. So don't omit looking at some of those. For instance, Genesis has a lot of the New Orleans records outside of the 19 volumes that they have there. So we've touched on, hopefully, a way to help you to add another piece to the puzzle and another piece to it. And we will join you all next week um, with Roots of Faith Ancestry. Thank you.